bring the lunch and learn. Uh, with that, I think I will turn it over to Alan and let him carry on. Great. Thank you so much, Susan, for that wonderful introduction for everything you do. We appreciate your providing and John and Paul, this platform, this community that we can all work in. And that's why I started talking about these CIO management type of topics, because even though I started out uh, being the PHP person for IBM I and working with open source, and that's what my company does, a lot of software development guidance and mentoring. But we thought, I thought, well, there has to be an IBM I for us to work on IBM I. And so there's so much this platform can do. Uh, I would like to share some thoughts with CIOs about what the platform can do. And not only that, but to start a meeting where IT directors and CIOs could talk among themselves and share because all of us say you're the only developer in your shop on a certain technology. You're going to feel pretty alone. You're going to do Googling, but you're never going to feel that confident in what you're finding. But if you have a peer group, either in your company or in a user group or with friends, you can hear what other people have done and learn from their experience and that you're not alone. And it's the same for uh, CIOs and IT directors. It can be very lonely at the top uh, of any organization, managing people, dealing with us crazy developers at the same time, uh, meeting the needs of management and business. And I thought having a community would really help and it did. And just doing that helped me learn. I could hear the ideas and questions that people had. And I started writing them down and I'll just show you, um, I'm gonna stop so you know I'm here live. I'm gonna stop my video and uh, share my screen. And uh, you should see this article from IT Jungle called Getting Offensive with a Legacy Label. This was coverage of, um, of our first CIO summit. It really struck a chord. Our clients were telling us, I really love the article. Uh, the president of one of our client uh, customer companies told me he loved this article. It's just what he needed to see because even though he's in the business side, but he needs to talk to his customers. He has to explain why his company provides the best systems available for his customers. So that's what business is thinking. IT, had, we think of that way at IT, but even business says, how am I going to explain what we have to our customers? And this was a company that had done some modernization. Their RPG was decent. They had a lot of PHP. And so you can just look this up, um, getting offensive with the legacy label uh, later. It's about the difference between the platform being modern and the application sometimes looking, looking old, even though they may be quite powerful and how to make that distinction. So that got me started thinking about uh, all this and that there's a role and I've just gotten more and more information as I've gone along. So I'll start the slides now. Again, as Susan said, if you have questions for me, put them in the Q&A. I may or may not see it. I may, because I'm looking, I've got a full screen of slides here. So I may need, um, Susan or John to break in and ask me if some questions come in. Okay. Yes, I know the title is a, a, a tongue twister, uh, but you know, I'm being a programmer myself, I'm a bit literal and there is an R and, and there is an I in the ROI, <laughs> literally. So uh, I had to do that. But there is an I in the ROI for sure. It's just a little bit about me. I did found Start Citing Group to help with open source and PHP but I've also become um, a speaker about different uh, management topics and how to work with business. Just, and uh, I did co-develop the PHP toolkit for IBM I. I found that uh, boosted my confidence a lot because my code now was out on GitHub. This is before everybody was doing it. Everyone's gonna look at my code, so I guess I'm all right, you know? But that was a mix of mixing the new, which was PHP at the time, and IBM I, RPG programs, COBOL programs, commands, APIs in the system and blending those worlds together and seeing how that worked. And I also started Club Sidon, the CIO Summit, again, um, to keep all that going. A Sidon group, we have a great team of wonderful people, some of the younger people in the uh, community working on the platform, uh, troubleshooting support, uh, even 24 seven support development training and so forth. Okay, enough about that. Um, so our agenda, we, we've really learned, this is not just my thoughts, this is what we've learned from other CIOs and IT directors. And uh, I hope if some of you have uh, good ideas here, normally this presentation is interactive. So maybe you'll type some of them in the Q&A and Susan or John can prompt me to, to share them if you want to. There's this legacy image, this legacy image. At, at a previous event, somebody in the audience said, well, legacy is actually what has made your company successful. Legacy is like the giant of business logic that's made your company successful in many cases. And then we add API uh, enablement and web applications on top of that very often, but, but not to denigrate that legacy. 
um, realize that it can be powerful. However, that's the applications. Don't think that IBM I is in any way something that you're stuck with because it's very powerful. So how to turn critics into supporters, that the platform is modern, okay? Even if your applications do need to be updated or should be updated. How to talk about modernization, what is this? There's so many ways of talking about it and we have so many different ideas. Often we think modernization is changing the appearance of an application. But often there's more underneath and we could talk about uh, that as well. Talk about ROI, return on investment, business language. Those of us who are developers, we didn't come up as business people. Some of you here listening, maybe more business people and less technical. So I suggest we all, uh, we all have to be friends and work together to find that right language. That's that mix of technical and business, that right blend to be seen as trustworthy, that we're not just uh, geeks or nerds or IBM in the IBM fan club. Um, so that we're actually objective. And then what to do if there's a potential that somebody is interested in removing IBM I altogether. I, I have this little icon with a little star, starstruck for innovative trends that we're seeing. That's, that's when I see clients, customers, or anyone else doing something really nice and I'm hearing it. Sometimes we're helping them, other times we just hear about it. But it's some trends that are actually happening, not just in our imagination, that would be nice, but actually happening. But how do we get to this point? We see various scenarios right now as we go along. Some uh, situations, business is doing fine. Many businesses have been growing. Now there's with COVID, there's interruptions, although some other businesses still are doing fine. And they're saying we need growth at any cost. We need to grow and we need to integrate. Some of these are very stable and IT is trusted. That's very nice. Now these situations can flip and change at any time. You could go from one scenario to another one. Other times this business requirements change, new integrations needed with APIs connecting to say uh, shipping companies, UPS, USPS, FedEx or international shipping that I haven't mentioned yet. And that needs to be done. So changes are needed there. Often there's new owners, new management comes in. We're seeing younger IT directors and CIOs, perhaps um, let's say under 40, under 50, under 40, younger ones who may have different ideas. They come in saying, well, what do we have here? Oh, IBM I, what's this? How does it look? Do I understand this? Let's talk to the developers, see what we have. Can I maintain this code? What are our skills? They're looking ahead. They aren't necessarily biased. They may have their opinions, but um, that's happening now, the new generation's coming in. Often functionality seems fine, but the interface needs an update. Here there could be a difference of opinion. Uh, there could be a difference of opinion here. Say IT says that this is, this is fine, or some people in the business say it's fine. Others say, no, no, it doesn't compare well to other systems out there. Uh, others I've been hearing, shadow IT. I wonder, this is not a question, you could say if you want, how many companies have shadow IT? Meaning at some point in the past, the business asked you, could you do something for us, something or other? You said, I'd love to, but I'm just too busy. And they say, okay, they go away and then maybe they buy a package that, that fulfills the function. Could be say customer service function, a customer relationship management function. And they implement it at a departmental level, maybe with additional consultants. And it seems to work, they're happy. But then what happens? They say, oh, IT department, we need data. Could you export some data for us? And then now you have two copies of the data, the core system running on the IBM I and then another system. And then you're asked to come in and um, synchronize the data. And it ends up being IT's job at the end anyway. So that's something that can happen. And then, then another t uh, area is the business sometimes, why, the business, why does the business go to outside vendors? Sometimes it's because they may not quite know what, what their vision is and, they, and they're looking for a vision. So that you and I, if you're in IT, you may be fulfilling requests from business. What if the business isn't quite sure they need to do something and they may turn to outside vendors for that vision. That's actually what happened. It's happening. It's not that you can't do something technically, it's actually the business vision. So if you can help fulfill some of that through your network, of contacts or your own imagination or your own conversations that can really help. That's often what the need is. Community is recognizing IBMI's value. There, there's a, an article that's great about by Gartner Group. Gartner questions the ROI of replacing traditional IBM platforms. And their subtitle was, considering leaving legacy IBM platforms, beware, beware as cost savings may disappoint while risking quality. This was an important article because many businesses rely on 
companies such as Gartner to tell them what's recommended. I'm just going to try, I wrote an article about this, which I'm glad I did because um, this Gartner article, the original is not available for free online anymore. You need to be a member of Gartner, I believe, but I did blog about it a while ago. And I was uh, disappointed that on IBM I, too often we get doom laden predictions. <laughs> for 20, 30 years, people have been saying the same things that the platform is shrinking and so on. That too many business and IT leaders unjustly associate the platform with old applications and stale business processes. So again, this is not about what the platform can do, it's about the business process. That IT is often used as a con convenient scapegoat for corporate issues with technology. That's not me saying this, that's Gartner saying that. That we should get the facts. Um, including what we're capable of in terms of open source languages and DevOps tools. That they, they recommend, and again, this is about communication, communication with the business, careful study. What unmet business needs are there right now? What are the business value and costs of the current platform? And incidentally, the link to this blog article is in the slides. You can look at this. Business values and costs of the current platform, in our case, probably IBM I, and all costs associated with the platform change and many hidden. This is so important because um, we have one customer who was considering not really a platform change, maybe switching to a, uh, an ERP system that that's already, seems already done. And it may seem, well, we're maintaining this custom system here in IBM I, but we could move to a system that's already coded, already done, has everything. Yeah, but on your, custom platform probably does a lot that you people forgot about that you'd have to re-implement or integrating with other systems that you've done custom integration there's so many costs um, so try to include all that in your thinking Gartner asks great questions what is the business unable to do right now to stay competitive or relevant and what's slow what business workflow steps require more time than they should you may be able to attack these small or medium-sized changes in place incrementally, minimizing disruption and expense because business people really don't want risk. They may be attracted to exciting ideas and things, but they really don't want extra risk. So by if you can show they can modernize in place, it can really help. Like there's so many costs that people may underestimate. Transition and testing. Disruption of business, parallel operation. Think about this. If you move to a new system, and if some of you have experience with this, please tell us. Running in parallel, you've got to run your new system in parallel with your old system. Where is the data captured? Is it being captured in the new system? How do you move that to the old one and parallelize and parallel and synchronize everything? And then you, even on the new platform, you'll still have to customize and modernize applications, and those, applica those uh, consultants are expensive. So anyway, you realize, I'm sure many of you realize, that if you just, you just, you can move some applications, uh, some parts of the application to other uh, systems if you want. Anyway, unfortunately, I recommended everyone read the report, uh, but uh, the online access has expired. Maybe I can get you a copy somewhere, a PDF, but I'm not sure if that's legal. But I just thought that was interesting that uh, we're seeing from Gartner. This is very important from outside resources, what they are saying, very critical. Uh, now, <laughs> You know that everything has two sides. So IBM I has been so successful, partly because it has done well with less. You know, many of you have very small. By the way, it's funny. I, I turned off my video and I find myself gesturing to the camera as if you can see me. But IBM I has done well with less. Many of your IT departments are very small. I see shops with one or two developers. Some may have 15, 25, which is great and important. More tip, but so many have small departments and you're saving the company money by being extremely efficient. And I think businesses don't always realize this, that you're much smaller shops than the norm. Might be helpful to find out what is the norm for your industry. IBM I has been very uh, efficient to develop on with DB2 and RPG being integrated. You don't need much operation uh, usually. And then, but it means that the company um, can expand or shrink IT as needed. So during lean economic times, companies need to stop training when I started, it was almost 30 years ago, and I listened to those ATS tapes. Do you remember those? I listened to those ATS tapes and learned, and it was training. And then somewhere along the line, it became the norm that we should expect that there, uh, we just should hire someone who's perfect already, has new talent. Although we do have customers, clients, who, who do train new RPG talent, young people. They train them maybe in RPG and PHP, both. 
but but somehow this idea came out that you don't have to train and but that, that means that you, you don't have a uh, talent any around, around anymore so um that's it you, you have a small number of developers and why can't you do more <laughs> we could we could spend some money on us right and we can do more definitely at the same time there's this explosion of uh, mobile social requirements remote workers especially now people working at home People are connected, expect to be connected all the time. Business people expect to be connected. New standards. We hear developers so often saying, well, it works. I know it's not pretty. That's not my department. Making it pretty is not my job. But that's called user experience, user interface. So many of us programmers are not user experience designers. Now the business people may not realize you could bring in some user experience uh, talent, user interface talent and improve user experience. It doesn't require a different platform for this. So it may help just to get some examples of what's possible, just to do something. Uh, even there's some open source applications that can run on the IBM I, um, content management systems, for example, or wikis. Also users do ex are expecting personalized information, real time updates, and there's some answers here. So I hope some of you have gotten into this already. Consuming APIs and providing APIs. Those, that is the language of now, APIs. Not those uh, IBM I APIs that begin with the letter Q. <laughs> These are HTTP based, like web-based APIs. They're extremely common. We're, this is probably number one from our clients, helping with APIs, because maybe they've just done green screen RPG for the most part, or even websites. And now they need to connect to say trucking systems to find out well, where's the truck, where's the trucker, where are they going? What's, what's the feedback from the, from the field or shipping, for example. So consuming and providing, and it's important to know the difference. Consuming is, um, it's your application needs to get data. It's like the same as if you're reading a database, except you're getting data from another program somewhere out there in your own shop or outside consuming. And it's really not that hard uh, in DB2, you could do HTTP get clob and pull in data and then use table functions to uh, parse it. That can all be done from RPG. There's also a uh, curl for those of you who like curl in C that's available to work with RPG. Other languages, Node.js is great at this, PHP. Uh, there's other ways, uh, many vendor products and open source products. I, I didn't list them all here. That probably would be a good article, wouldn't it? Like a list of all these potential ways to consume APIs. And then providing APIs to the outside. That's a different thing. That's when it's your data and your business logic and you're providing this logic. So in the past, or even now, maybe some of you have done uh, stored procedures or toolkit calls to provide data that can be called from either your system or another language. But now it's possible to do that through HTTP, meaning it's totally language independent, even platform independent. No one, like that old joke on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. But no one has to know even what platform you are necessarily. IBM I, Linux, Windows, wherever you are, or the cloud. It's very uh, platform neutral. And you'll find that makes it very friendly. And it means that if you provide an API, you can control the logic. You're not worried about someone hacking your data, getting into your data, getting data they don't understand, because you can provide um, the data in, say, Node.js, uh, not Node, um, JSON format, for example. JSON formatted data with REST APIs or there's a new format called uh, GraphQL that's very good. So uh, IBM provides a tool, IWS, that does this. Node.js is very good, PHP, and again, many other tools also can provide this. Even your, your RPG, plain old RPG, can do this through CGI uh, as well. Many tools, and I'm sure the other people on this call, Susan, John, and many others have used uh, many of these and have uh, recommendations too. So this is very possible, I think, to start thinking about this. Start thinking about the language of APIs. So taking up the challenge, the thing is your old code probably still works. Applications are monolithic maybe with valuable logic inside. Line of business applications uh, built in silos, meaning it's hard to interact with them. They work on their own, but maybe, maybe it's hard to make them into APIs. Maybe there's changes, for instance, tax changes, and it can flow throughout your whole application. So We've been, uh, many of you have been modularizing, making your code more modular, creating service programs, for example, in RPG, refacing it, refacing your database. Paul Tui has a nice series of articles on refacing your database, making the database look better, easier to use. Um, but what else um, hits us here? This is paying back technical debt. I just want to use this terminology. 
I find on IBM I, we tend to use, we tend to think we're the only ones who have these like challenges. But really in life, who, who says our, I mean, who has a life or job or work that just goes totally smoothly? Challenges are part of life. And this technical debt is terminology that exists in every IT system, not only on IBM I at all, at all. I heard one company president refer to it as deferred maintenance, like on a house. You want to reduce your maintenance costs on your house or apartment? Okay, you can just put some patches over it, maybe paint it once in a while, but you're letting it go. You're not replacing things. And that's called technical debt, deferred maintenance. Eventually you have to do it. You can choose the timing. You just can't ignore it forever. And on IBM I, we can ignore it for a long, long time because IBM I even doesn't force us to recompile at all. Eventually you do have to update your code somewhere. So terminology you may want to use is called refactoring. How many of you, I'm just in your own minds think, how many of you know that word refactoring and use it? This is standard terminology elsewhere in the industry. On IBM I, we say we've got to modernize, we have to do something, we're embarrassed, but no, it's just refactoring, it's simple. So we know we need to modernize, but call it refactoring. It's the industry standard term. And we can choose our timing. Again, we've been able to work with a small staff and not do much for a long time, but now we need so many different skills open source, regulations, business logic, user interface, web, mobile. Write down what all the skills are and find out what they are. Refactoring is a skill itself. It can be learned. And where do you start? And how do you justify this to the business? Start with the largest or biggest return on investment. You must have some applications that have been difficult to work with. Say it's the order entry, you say, oh no, I can't order entry, I don't wanna go in there, that's too risky. So those places, you do your best to um, refactor those somehow. Refactor it, take out little parts, go slowly, map it out because it'll have a large impact on your business. Then the next time you have to make a quick fix somewhere, you won't be so scared and the business won't have to be scared. I think that's something you can explain because at one of our CIO events, I said, how do you justify this to management? And one CIO said, remember that module where every time you ask me to, to do make a change, it takes a long, long time. This is the reason why we want to fix that so it doesn't take so long because business will remember that. So um, yeah, refactoring is essential for all platforms, all languages and databases. It's required for improving quality, performance, ease of maintenance, testing and compatibility with new technology. I just decided before doing this talk today, I thought, oh, let me just search because we think that only RPG gets stale after a while. I'm gonna type in and search for refactoring Node.js applications. If you have, you'd have to say, I hope you'd agree with me, Node.js is the hottest new kind of uh, language on the IBM I. You've been hearing about it a lot. There's a lot of investment in it. It's very good, moving very fast. There's even newer languages, but Node.js is kind of a mainstream, very hot one. So sure enough, on AWS, Amazon's platform, breaking a monolith. In fact, if you look at this overview, it says in this tutorial, you'll deploy a monolithic Node.js application to a Docker container, then decouple the application to microservices without any downtime. Microservices, it's like service programs, small services that are easier to deploy uh, smaller. So, and then why this matters, traditional monolithic architectures are hard to scale. So I think there's just a natural progression in all these languages and platforms. Uh, starting big, getting small, and then the, they get big again because you start adding code. You add it, you're just responding to the business, adding functionality and enhancements the fastest way you can to get things done. And gradually you build up and up and up and eventually you can be sort of monolithic again, unless you refactor gradually as you go. But anyway, I wanted just to show you this, that even Node.js, the newest technology that's only been around a small number of years, this is JavaScript, still, it's still a topic everywhere where you read, have to read an article about it. Introduction, containerize the monolith, deploy the monolith, break the monolith, ow, don't break the monolith. Do not break the monolith, I repeat, do not break it. Okay, great. So will our C CEO fund this effort? So you can use this terminology, deferred maintenance, and that was told to me by a company president when I started talking about how you can let things go for a long time. And it's better to do it while you have control, while you know what you're doing rather than being forced into something. And he had this analogy for like a house. Do you, if you have holes in the roof, do you put buckets underneath it? Do you, um, 
which is like the quick fixes, okay? Or do you say, let's move to a new house, which is like re-platforming? New problems, potentially. You don't know what the problems are. In your current system, you know what the problems are. A uh, new house always seems good, but it's newly made and has not been tested, has not been settled through. Uh, this, we call this a McMansion, meaning a large house that's cheaply constructed, not been tested. It may start look good on day one and then start to fall apart. Or you could rent, which is like going to the cloud. That's like renting a house if you want to continue the analogy. Even then, just to talk about the cloud, you're still really responsible. There, there may be a cloud vendor um, hosting this, but you're, you're still responsible to make sure you have proper backups and that it meets your needs and has everything you need then. So you may want to get to continue the analogy. There's one more bullet point in this house analogy. Even I'm getting tired of it. But you could uh, hire a house assessor, someone to check out your system and evaluate it for you. And there'll be different opinions. I, I've known of IVMI shops where business doesn't quite trust the CIO and they bring in the consulting firm to come in and say, here's what you have. Well, you definitely need uh, to install Microsoft Dynamics or whatever. And they may not have understood the business. And so then business will bring in a second a second advisor who maybe knows about the IBMI and give a different viewpoint that, okay, I see this is basically sound. You need to make some changes here. So it depends who you bring in. I've heard of that many times. Often after bringing in someone to check out the systems, business has more confidence in IBMI and in IT. Often happens that way. The relationship gets better due to the discussions and even the stress. So what's the ROI of refactoring? More agility, less time spent on code maintenance. If the code is modular, less time needed for testing. And I've been hearing uh, shops say that once a year they get a new software update installed and it takes them weeks to do it. Automated testing will help. There's uh, packages such as IBMI unit, that's an open source one for unit testing of RPG. End-to-end -end testing is like from the user point of view, if I log in and making sure all the screens or pages are right all the way through. I know this has been slow, coming to IBMI automated testing, but it really can pay off. We, we worked on a system for a um, health insurance company, new web-based system for consumers to apply for health insurance. And the user interface got pretty complicated because it was very exacting. And um, we found it was easy for one developer to kind of cause, a, cause problems or bugs. When we uh, initiated end-to-end -end testing, the quality just got so good, the users really relaxed, they knew the bugs would never return. It's very important, end-to-end -end testing, once things get to a certain level of complexity, it can really help. There's open source tools, there's Selenium, it's like as if you're running with a browser, but it's automated, and that works for 5250 as well. And there's also commercial tools, many ways to do it, but I would really think it's just looking into this so that you can make changes without being afraid, that you know it'll function the same. Okay, so feel free to put some Q&As if you have any. This is our friend Liam here. I don't know if he, I should probably update this uh, photo sometime. But the our refactoring does have a strong ROI. You can get access to real-time data without having to just be limited to whatever reports exist already. You open business logic to non-IBMI developers. So you can work as a team back and forth, team up young at heart, mobile and web experts with seasoned business analysts because we know that the newer developers may not know the business so well or what the, what the data means. This way you can make it available. And the IBMI becomes a more valuable uh, core system of record to maybe even external systems, which refactoring can all help with. I know it's not always easy. Uh, here's, this is a nice, I showed you Node before, Node.js. There's a book about re modernizing legacy applications in PHP. Yeah, PHP isn't the new kid on the block. There are legacy applications in PHP. And I really enjoy, I enjoyed reading this because of the arguments he puts forward like um, say you want to rewrite or put a new system in. Well, if it's a rewrite, who would do the rewriting to, to a new application? Is it the team that created the old application? Well, if so, they're still maintaining the old application. They have no time to maintain the new application. If it's a new team, they won't know what the old application did without bothering the old team. I thought that was interesting. So he felt that refactoring is often the best way to go, even though people like something shiny and new. And I'm not, of course, against something shiny and new if you really have to. But, it's, but his approach was refactoring and gradually, because that way you keep the old application maintained and gradually improved by the team who understands it. Also think about the fact that uh, you're not gonna stop enhancing the old application. 
So say you write a specification for the new one. Meanwhile, the old one's improving and you never, you're not keeping up. Just some thoughts, okay? Just some thoughts, that's all. <laughs> so it's uh, advised to do some good practices, source and version control, history and rollback. There are many commercial tools. There's like, uh, I'm not gonna say the names, vendors, some good vendors out there, as well as open source technologies such as Git, GitHub, GitLab, and so forth that provide source and version control with history. That's important. Don't just make copies of your source members anymore. So some shops don't have this yet. Automated testing, which I mentioned a couple of times. Automated deployment for consistency. Fewer uh-ohs, be consistent. I know it seems like more work at first, but once you get your pattern down, it'll be easier and easier to bring on new people into your shop, less a much lower learning curve. So that this helps to fight the fear of refactoring or making changes. Other important messages. These principles let you take a controlled risk now. Some of you may be in a situation where there's already uh, talk about moving off the platform or making big changes. But if you're, if you're not in a situation at this point, and you have control, take those controlled risks now. Try to do that. Reduce your risk in the future. Uh, I also say if there's any proposals to make big changes, what if you did nothing? What if you did nothing? you're gonna have some risks and lost opportunities. Um, like right now, developers who understand the business logic are retiring and that's a fear of everybody. We just worked with a company where their former IT director had retired. Luckily, we got him on the phone and we could work with him and he understood the reasons behind things. It was just so helpful. But so try to get people before they retire and talk to them and work with the systems, refactor, document and so on. Do that, do, try to do that. So, okay, about this perception. This is a favorite topic of mine. What's legacy? Often the applications look like legacy, but the platform is new. And people confuse that. In fact, IT sometimes unwittingly is a part of that problem. A business, business person will say, well, can you do this with your system? And they say, oh, the AS400 can't do it. I've heard that, AS400 can't do it. What do they mean? Do they really mean IBM I can't do it? No. The application can't. The application that they've left a long time can't be changed easily to, or enhanced. And they say AS400 and that's what they mean. I have a, a little story here. I was at a customer where I was in the room alone with one of the business people. And she, um, she said, IT is always telling us the AS400 can't do it. What do you think about that? Don't we need a new platform? I said, you don't have an AS400. I have good news for you. You don't have an AS400. You have an IBM I. It can do everything you need. And she was happy. This was a vice president of sales. She was really happy. Later on, a different vice president came in, I think the marketing person. And um, it turns out it was his birthday. And she told him, guess what Alan told me? We don't have an AS400. We have an IBM I. And he said, that's the best birthday present I could have asked for. We sometimes underestimate the intelligence of, intelligence of business people, they're smart, they're, and they're really smart. They knew what that meant, that they actually could do what they needed to do on the IBM I platform without taking a big risk and jumping off somewhere. So that was really great. Um, this is not just about end users, but even your own tools that you use. For instance, using SEU, try to use RDI and modern tools for development. They really do help, especially reading other people's code, they actually do help. Take the time to learn. If you started using an older version of RDI in the past and it was too slow, you weren't happy with it, try again because it has major improvements all the time and there's some experts um, on that that can help you. But it'll imp help improve perception because I, I've heard from IT directors, the new ones, I'm talking about the young ones coming in saying, my RPG developers are really slow, what's going on? And I say, oh, RPG developers are fast in my book. I always thought they were quick, but because they were still using SEU, so they didn't know about RDI. Okay, so about watching your language, I just, I created this chart for one of my DB2 database presentations, but I like just to have this, try to use modern language. So when we're referring to code modernization, I like to choose a different word that's more precise. Refactoring, deferred maintenance, paying back technical debt. People from outside of the platform will understand that. On the database side, don't say physical file, say table. I know a lot of you do this already. Logical file, say a view, which is not exactly the same. Logical files like a view and an index, but that's a good thing to say. Instead of records, say row. Field is a column, library, 
schema. I have trained myself. At first, it was hard to say column. I kept wanting to say field, but say column. Many times I'll say both. If there's any other terminology, please uh, paste it on in. Again, I'm not watching the Q&A right now, but if someone wants to tell me some later on, I think we'll have time at the end. But if you have any other terminology, I think it can really help to say the right words, to blend the teams. So there is a cultural shift and it's important to communicate. And this is uh, just so important. We, we're just so busy, tend to stay to ourselves sometimes. Make a human connection. Talk to end users and get to know them. Now, I don't just mean, in the old days, often end users would talk to programmers directly and ask for things. That was okay. I guess there was a connection then. Now we're a little more organized and we do this less. But um, find some social people, some extroverts who appreciate progress and will talk about it and praise IT, say the good word about IT. So talk to the end users, get to know them. What are their hurdles? What are their problems? There may be situations you don't know about. If you actually just sit with them, you may see something slow, like they, like they say, oh, I never use option number five. It's too slow. I always do option one, nine, and six instead. And they're doing a lot more work than they had to. If you could just watch them, you may find something easy you can do to save them time. And because people are resourceful, they may be solving their own problems in ways that are not optimal. You can engage in what we call skunk works projects. That's like experiments to solve a problem. And then you can make it the user's uh, success that they can brag or boast in the end. Try to get users on your side. Uh, someone told me about the 10, uh, 80, 10 rule. Get 10% of the users on your side and then you can win over the additional 80%. So that's the power users or people who will sing your praises. They'll help you get it correct and then help you win over the other 80%. And the last 10% will never be happy. You can't win over everybody, but you'll get that 90% this way. One CIO tried something interesting. He tried an invitation only application rollout. Like I think uh, Gmail did that originally where you send it to a few users and they can invite each other. And instead of trying to push something, it's like it's reverse psychology. Instead of trying to push something and try to force everyone, you kind of get people curious and interested with an invitation only rollout. So more about listening. I find this fascinating because many of us are a bit introverted and would just like to stay with our technical areas that we're comfortable with. But it's important to listen and have a structure for communication. I find my team is uh, remote. We work in our own homes and uh, we need structure to make sure we communicate properly. I, I know many of you are at home now because of the COVID situation, but it's even true people in an office don't always communicate. So certain situations may arise that if business users tr may try to dictate technology, say we should be using SAP or Salesforce, and I'm not knocking any of those, Oracle, whatever, but there may be something behind that. What's the source? What is it they can't do now with the current solution? Again, it may be perception or it may be real. There, is there some business problem they're trying to solve? Do they think IT is just too slow, not responsive? It's the look and feel, user experience. What do they dream of having? Ideally, you can get ahead of this and do this early on, but you can try to do it at any stage and find an approach. Uh, for instance, maybe you get approval to do a design, a graphical design, like we're doing this for a client now, graphical design, what your dream system is. Listen and do a graphical design and show what's possible. Irrespective of technology, what would you love to have? And then see and then propose building that for the IBM I or connecting to it. Or perhaps another system is proper. Who knows? You don't know. Be objective. It's not like we're IBM I. We are IBM I fans, but we can be objective too. I also strongly suggest something I've heard um, great success with. Have, if you can, have a daily breakfast or lunch meeting, short meeting with business leaders. Here, it's like any relationship. Try to listen to the small issues before they become too large. Don't wait until something builds up and they're not talking to you anymore. Try to talk every day. You can talk about what you're doing. They can say what they're thinking about. You're on their side. They trust you and you can trust them. I know it's not always easy, but I've heard of really some bad situations that got turned around through this type of communication. And you have your own business acumen also. You may have your own suggestions, especially if you join some networking groups and industry uh, groups. You can find out what's going on in the industry and share your own acumen, go back and forth. Often I've heard this, is the, this has been the answer to really great improving relationships that have soured. And then try to be objective evaluating requests have some type of metrics. 
talking to business people, have some type of metrics. If you don't, people may just, they may think, well, you just like the IBM on, you're just an IBM person. So what are your metrics? Reliability, scalability, ease of maintenance, high availability, risk of security, what's the threat profile? How risky or not risky is this? Um, what's the cost of acquisition, implementation, maintenance? Measure everything and get some help if you need it. Then you'll be able to say, I've evaluated the return on investment, the ROI, or we did that before. We know it didn't add up and you can explain the reasons why. It's hard not to appear defensive, but see if you can do it this way and try to explain it through numbers and keep, keep going with this. And maybe get some help if you need help. If you're not a much of a business person, get some help with your, through your network or maybe a consultant who specializes this way or other friends at conferences. It's also important to prioritize requests that are coming in because in IT, you don't want to say no. Sometimes you have to, you can't do everything at once, but you have to prioritize your requests. So try to adopt a system to track requests and keep on top of it, not just emails coming in, a real system. Uh, some uh, of our uh, friends have created steer steering committees that are not just IT, but have users and management. Say 10 end users and managers where there's a scoring system. And so IT is not making the decisions. Sure, IT can talk about the difficulty level. How much time would it take? Judge how much time it would take, but in terms of benefit to the business, have the business people decide themselves. Uh, so a scoring system, how many departments would benefit? And maybe meeting once a week for 15 minutes and then change the people in the committee. There's all different ways to do it, but this is key. It doesn't, shouldn't be like IT said no. That's what you want to avoid. C, because one department may not realize that you're working on requests from other departments. It's not as if you're doing nothing. That's important. Also, what may help is writing uh, reports like maybe every week or every month. Say you have a project management system, whether it's Trello or, or Jira, something more sophisticated. Create reports, send it to the business. Let them see all these small requests you're doing that they may not be aware of. Even just keeping the lights on. Somebody at one of our CIO summits says, in IT, if you do a perfect job, nobody knows you did anything. If you do a perfect job, nobody knows you did anything. It's so true. When there's a problem, people know. If everything's fine, no one knows. Do some kind of reporting, whether it's monthly, quarterly, yearly. Take the time to discuss this. What was good, what was bad, and maybe have something automated that just tells what's going on. The business may just not know. They may not know. Testing and deployment. This is essential. Often we think about just development time or acquisition time of a package. Testing is so often just left on IT, like, okay, IT, now you test it, give it to us when it's perfect, <laughs> when it's all done. No, users have to be included and this has to be included in the plan. Users have to be responsible for their portion of the testing somehow and plan for this phase. Uh, one CIO that I know who just retired, but he made a chart showing the progress of testing by end users how far along were users in testing every single module in the application? He wouldn't make anything go live until the users had tested and he could mark it off. Make that very visible. This has to be part of it. IT just can't. They just can't be totally responsible. However, IT can do its part. And part of that is automated testing so that at least if a bug is found, the users won't encounter the same bug twice. You can have automated tests that are implemented so you can check for things. So this is just important. Well, a friend, a consultant friend I know um, compared software development or any project to like a pregnancy with his three trimesters. She called it the fourth trimester was the testing and deployment, just often forgotten. You've got a plan for this documentation too. Very important. Um, now, what if you are in this rough situation where a rip, so-called rip and replace is contemplated, where someone comes in and says, we, we can't do this on the eye, we don't trust you, or your system's way off base, okay? So first try to find some stories, try to find other people who've been in a similar situation to be able to compare. Your social network may have this. Replacements just always sound easy, always underestimated. They always say we'll get it done in six months. Every plan is always six months no matter what, right? <laughs> Maybe 10, but it really could be years and uh, be a big distraction while the business can stagnate. It's not that it's impossible or can never be successful. It just takes a large amount of resources. It makes me think, what if we had that same amount of resources for internal use 
to improve what we have. Maybe even having consultants. Okay, programmers aren't user experience experts. Get some consultants to help with user experience. Fine. Supplement what you have. Anyway, I just thinking of that. If you really had that same budget, what could you do with that with that budget that you might have? Um, let me just think. You, I, must, I think I may have a slide about this. IBM has resources for you. There's the uh, Rochester Briefing Center. There's Steve Will. So you could go to the Briefing Center virtually for now and get information of what IBM is capable of. Steve Will from IBM specializes in, almost in talking to companies who don't understand what the IBM I can do. And he can be there as your advocate. So consultants can do it. Like we do that for our clients, but if you need it, Steve, someone like Steve Will from IBM can help you there, as well as many people on this call here. Realize that you can integrate with other systems, cloud platforms. It's not an all or none. If they want Salesforce, you can integrate, not only with sending data back and forth, Salesforce, MuleSoft, but with APIs as well. Server-to-server -server communication. There's tons of options right now. It's all possible. Some are running, like say, Node.js on an Azure platform and connecting the data on the eye through ODPC. You can run those kinds of systems on the eye or somewhere else. It can all work. So uh, just a summary here. We're not alone. Users of other platforms have the same issues we do with refactoring, deferred maintenance, needing to update our systems. The grass is not always greener. Use the right terminology. Say it's deferred maintenance. Say it's refactoring. Have high self-esteem. We're doing a great job. We've done a great job for the business over a long time for very low cost, and we still are continuing to do that. Communication. Build up that trust. There's so many ideas here. Some I didn't even mention yet. There's the daily breakfast or lunch with the business, if you can possibly do it. Reports on what you've achieved. Uh, some of our CIOs have started an open house where end users and business could come into IT and see what the developers are working on and see what they're doing, see things from the developer point of view. At the same time, developers can go in and you can go in and sit with end users and see things from their point of view. This is even true if you have remote uh, workers, if it's possible to see them um, when things get safer, to see them in person or on the phone and build that trust back up. Talk the language of return on investment, ROI. Be able to have measurements of what your system does the cost and the cost associated with a new system. Appreciate everything, including refactoring. That book about PHP refactoring was fabulous for helping me see why refactoring can often be better than going to a totally new system. It's often those little things though. We did work for a company that had their own customer relationship management system, CRM. And there became this growing call to move to Salesforce. And I am never, I'm not putting that down. Salesforce is good. But their in-house system they had done themselves was very close to what they needed. They just needed, there was frustration. They needed a couple of other columns of data almost. It was really close, almost good enough. And if, if IT had known this was important, they could have built this in and um, done the job for less money, a lot less expensively and more quickly if they only had known. Integration has a lot of new options. Um, again, I didn't mention this again. I mentioned this a few times, but realizing the difference between the legacy application and the IBM I and the platform. Remember my story, the business is happy to hear. We don't have AS400, we have IBM I. In fact, you could go ahead and tell them, hey, good news, you know that AS400 you're always complaining about? Replace it with IBM I. I mean, that sounds silly, but it's almost true. So I wonder if there's some more takeaways here. Uh, I have some more resources. I see a Q&A came up. So we'll check out what that is. But um, there's a, a developer works resource that talks about IBM I uh, value. Is life better on another database platform? Rob Bestian's uh, about a presentation about db 2 for i which has been fantastic. I didn't mention this in the presentation, but there's so many great IBM I services based on DB2. Much easier ways to get access to system information the programmers can do. IBM I in the age of digital transformation. Um, Mike Kane always has good information about having an advocate for the IBMI to, to there. Actually, and then um, a system I developer, seven habits of highly effective IBMI advocates. I an earlier presentation about the legacy label. Uh, I'm going to check the Q&A in a minute. 
uh, sign group along with CI with uh, system I developer the summit conference. We'll see when things get back to normal. We'll see what we want to do, but we do a CIO summit twice a year, which is free. You can see the picture on this slide has me with Scott Forsty. He's was a fantastic guest. Um, we have many fantastic guests from IBM speaking and answering questions. It's really about networking too. You're not alone. We've heard people come of people coming to the CIO summit, and I'm, I'm allowed to promote this because I don't charge for it. It's really just to help the community who've attended and gone back and written a report for their management, who then redoubled their enthusiasm and confidence in IBMI. Maybe they weren't sure, but then hearing of the solutions from other CIOs and IT directors, not from even vendors, we love vendors, but not from vendors, but from their peers, what is possible and coming back and sometimes even getting a promotion. So if you wanna hear about those, um, go to, you can go to sightinggroup.com slash tips. That's our newsletter, which we send once in a while. And we'll tell you about the new CIO summits uh, coming up. So those are really cool. Let's um, just have a final slide just about Sighting Group here, things we do. But I would like to see what the Q&A is right now. Because we have a few more minutes from Rick. What do we think about developing new apps on the cloud while keeping the IBM I as a system of record? Do you feel this could be a potential path to modernization of new tools and development platforms. Yes, it is possible. This is developing apps on the cloud while keeping the IBM I system of record. It is definitely possible. Everything you could do on the cloud, you can do on the IBM I, but sometimes the infrastructure is already there. You don't have to think quite as much. For instance, on Microsoft Azure cloud, we heard good results. One of our people um, um, has been developing a node application, actually a mobile app for a, a customer client. The, the mobile app, it's a native mobile app that gets data from the IBM I through Node.js Node APIs. And that was done on Microsoft Azure. And that had a lot of DevOps and processes and procedures already there, incorporated there. So that may be one reason to do it. Okay, so definitely it is possible. Maybe some of your web workload, you could definitely do on another platform and connect to the I through ODBC. You have a choice. It really depends what your skill set is. Okay, so definitely that's possible. In fact, I'm hearing the, the newer CIOs are coming along. Generally speaking, have a lot of respect for IBM I as a database server at the very least. Um, so they say, oh, I, I definitely want to keep that. And they're thinking maybe change the mix uh, around, but they definitely appreciate IBM I. Um, and Rick has another question here. Thinking of an app that requires big data that's not suitable to the eye, you mean like an, uh, maybe analytics? You're thinking of some kind of analytics where the software exists on other platforms, perhaps is what you're thinking. Well, IBM I does have some new languages, has an R, the R language, which is new to IBM I, which is an analysis language, does charts, graphs. You can run R from on the IBM I or off the IBM I. Maybe you're thinking of some other things, Hadoop or some other big data type of platforms. That's possible. I'm not sure. Maybe you could um, let us know specifically. That's not really my area of expertise. Um, so, you know, DynamoDB with Lambda, you're saying, other kinds of databases. I mean, some of these are coming to the eye, but okay. Good question. These are interesting for future topics. Another question Jeff is asking, uh, I truly believe IBM I should have more prepackaged ERP that can entice customers. Yeah, you came from CRM and Lotus Notes into Salesforce to IBM I and now maybe off the IBM I entirely. Share your thoughts as execs often use Gartner reports to influence decisions. Yes, there was that Gartner, uh, Gartner study that I made a link to. Uh, the link is gone, but my blog post is there. And if you're subscribed to Gartner, you can get it. I totally agree. I know IBM has been working with Gartner too to make sure Gartner has updated information. However, that question of prepackaged ERP is a difficulty that some of those ERP vendors are kind of ignoring IBM I. I agree. In the early days, those applications just were there. And so it was easy to move to an ERP. There are ERPs that run on IBM I. And maybe we should even uh, system I developer people. Maybe sometime we should actually make a list, like do a survey, make a list of those. Be interesting. Which ERP, ERPs do exist on the I? I get asked once in a while. But that's, that's definitely a um, valid point, Jeff, I would say. Okay. Any other questions? Alan, I have a question. Uh, if you don't mind me uh, uh, sure. interrupting, this is kind of a small point that you mentioned earlier, but um, sort of in passing about uh, automated testing. And you mentioned Selenium specifically. Mm 
Right. Um, I just wondered if you could elaborate on, you know, do, are, are IBMI customers using that um, particular solution and, um, you know. Yes, yeah, Selenium is kind of a that. homegrown one. So if you have developers who, who have done work with websites, web application, who like PHP or Python and like coding things themselves, they could use Selenium, which is like, uh, it's as if you you do the work of a web browser without having the browser there. So it's like, okay, if the user types a username and password, they should get a welcome screen with their name on it. Hmm. It can kind of take you through what the user path would be and make okay. sure that everything comes up. So it's, it's actually checking for uptime, that there's no database issues. You may have issues, this is called end-to-end -end testing, issues that aren't related to your coding necessarily, but maybe the database had a change. There's a, some kind of lock. Um, make sure that performance is adequate. However, there's other solutions. There's cloud-based solutions. There's other tools that do this testing so you don't have to hand code it. There's one from one of the big vendors that has an automation tool. If you look up automation tools, there's some that are specifically made for IBMI that even can contact 5250. So you can do 5250 testing that way as well as web-based testing. There's some automation tools that are commercial ones and open source ones. And Selenium is kind of the developer style tool using kind of web and uh, for automated testing. Does that so answer? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it, it does. Um, you also mentioned specific, I thought I heard you mention specifically that it works with green screen as well. Um, yeah, if you, it works with green screen if you use a web front end for it. Like, so there's different oh. web, there's different web front ends right. um, okay. for the green screen. It has like the field names kind of in the screen more or less. I think it's a little sloppy, but it's, it kind yeah. of works. <laughs> kind of okay. works. There's, there's different solutions to that. Uh, yeah, so Selenium may, may or may not be the, the best, but it does work. So okay. it depends but on your are, But there are other solutions that- uh, There are other solutions also that, that use the APIs, the LAPI APIs, for example. Great. Automated testing, yeah. Okay. Cool.